So we've had a bit of this, and a bit of that, and some more of this. Everything that you'd expect in the Wilder Fury 2 final press conference. So welcome back, it is Believe in Bruce, the body language guy. If you're interested in body language, performance, psychology, mental health, well-being, anything to do with the head and heart, then this is the channel for you. Now if you look below, I've got 32,000 subscribers. 32, it's brilliant. My next marginal gain, if you will, is to go for 40,000. So if you do like body language and all this type of stuff, then please subscribe below to try to get me towards that 40,000 mark. It would really be appreciated. And again, we're going to be looking at politicians' body language language coming up, sports stars, more sports stars, celebrities and even some really interesting criminals I've been watching on Netflix. I'm going to go through some of the stuff that I've seen in the press conference. Some of the stuff that when either Tyson Fury was speaking, what was Deontay Wilder doing? When Deontay Wilder was speaking, what were, when the trainers were speaking, what were both of the fighters doing? So keep watching. From a boxing perspective, or any type of fighting perspective, even just from an observing of human behaviour perspective is that what you can see when you're not part of the argument, if you will, when you're not face to face, is there's things that other people do that irritates either or opponent. So it could be irritates Tyson Fury, it could be irritates Deontay Wilder. But that's what you get when you're in tune with body language of watching what other people do to a potential opponent and then having the choice to utilize those strategies because it's obvious when you know what you're looking for, what irritates that particular person. And this is what we see in abundance within this press conference. What did you see? Let me know below. What body language stuff for you picking up on. So let's get straight into it then. So what we've got is the finest of the context. The context is absolute key. All right, we've got to understand the context. It is fight week. The fight is only a few days away. And for you guys who normally tune in or you want something different, if you've never done it before, I'm going to be back on True Geordie's live stream. For the banter, for the crack to talk about all things boxing and again, we'll probably talk about a lot more things as well. So please feel free to join us there, it will be a night of educated chat and entertainment. But body language, comfort, discomfort, synchrony, congruence, are they looking happy, are they looking sad, are they looking okay, are they looking irritated? That's generally where we start digging into from a body language perspective. So again, because we're looking at boxing here, I went to one of the top promoters in the world, Eddie Hearn, and the question was asked to him, it was like, Eddie, if you had to choose one person, one person in the whole wide world who you would trust from a body language analysis for a huge boxing fight like this, who would it be, Eddie? Believe in Bruce. <laughs> Believe in Bruce. So again, just from the previous press conference, what we've seen here is an elevated emotional baseline. That press conference a few weeks back, there is definitely an elevation here from both Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury, but that still gives that emotional baseline in the context of this particular press conference, and that's important to note. And what's really interesting from this bit of body language is that Tyson Fury, although they're verbalised and they're using a thing here called active disruption, it's like, I'm trying to talk across you, and Deontay Wilder actually does pretty well throughout the press conference in control in Tyson Fury. It's usually Fury who is the entertainer, it's usually Fury who feeds off that energy. Off the I've always said with Fury, probably if, if you're ever going to fight Fury, it's, it should be somewhere like Saudi Arabia, where there's not that atmosphere, where there's not that electricity, where you can't actually draw that from the crowd. Because it's usually Fury who bounces, that, that, that's where he gets a lot of his energy from. He is a natural entertainer, he's got a desire, a need with inside him to, to entertain the crowd. But what you see here is Deontay Wilder. He actually takes that from him and he starts to, what's again, act of disruption. I'm just going to keep talking over you, talking over you. And rarely do we see Fury, he's not backing down, but he lets Deontay Wilder win that verbal war, if you will. Like He actually says, oh, do you know what, I've had enough, I'm just going to let Wilder talk. In this particular bit here, he tries to use a fact against Deontay Wilder. So have a look at this and see if you can see Fury using the fact. And again, that can't be argued with. It's like he did. <laughs> I get knocked out, but he, he did get up again. And that's something that's very important. Tyson Fury, factually, has never been knocked out. He's never been knocked out. Yes, he got put down by Cunningham. Yes, he got put down by Deontay Wilder. Not one punch off Deontay Wilder like Brazil. In the 12th round when he was fatigued, he got hit with a beautiful right and then a solid left hand as well. And that couldn't put him down. That couldn't keep him down, I should say. They didn't get the knockout. 
So there is some actual truth in what Tyson Fury is saying there, and is he taking comfort from that? I love this bit of body language here. It's a display from the yeah uh, from the host. So he tried to sort of organise it at the start, then he thought this is just not going to go the way that I want. But you'll see what he's doing. He couldn't lean any more towards Deontay Wilder if he tried. And you'll see that he brings his leg up, and his, his leg is providing a barrier to Tyson Fury. So from this, again, from a body language perspective, he feels more comfortable, you know, leaning towards Deontay Wilder than he does the unpredictable face and fury. Deferential the two of you have been in the lead up to this fight. You guys have shown great... A total act of disruption here. It, this is the verbal war. Who's, it's a bit like, you know, when the uh, fighters come face to face. Who's going to look away first? This is a case of it's who is going to stop speaking first. And this is throughout the interviews that they do in this particular press conference. Which, but here's just an example of it. This man on the planet, the hardest hit a bunch of boxing in the history, period. The one is gonna whoop your ass. And again, it's cut, so it's like a physical. My chest is bigger than yours, but I am more articulate at verbalizing my thought. I can control. I, I can, it's almost like a your mama the type of thing that goes on. But this act of disruption, it goes on throughout the press conference, and it really is no fighter wants to give an inch to the other fighter. There's an actual battle going on here for the verbal space, the power within their mind that the, whoever wins the verbal war takes that pride, takes that comfort from having defeated the other person at some type of battle. Now you see here, obviously Fury got a cut, a big cut in his last fight, and that would be a concern. And you'll notice, remember, when we talk about body language, we talk about that T-junction. Two seconds before, two seconds after, what was said, either side, and what did the body do? And you'll notice here that the reporter mentions about the 47 stitches, and then you can see Fury thinking about it, and then he wipes himself, he gives himself a self-soothe. He knows that that cut's going to be a problem because that's why you see the self-soothe. When somebody rubs their arm, when somebody rubs their leg, somebody rubs their beard. At that particular moment, he's processed what the report has just said, so hey, that is naturally, and again, there's nothing the matter with that. I'm just pointing out that he had a thought going on and the body's showing you by that rub what he's thinking. Thinking about this fight is 47 stitches along that eye your reaction it's supposed to, to be stopped by the way in september and your feeling for the imp feeling for the imp feeling for the imp now this is great one of the previous videos i talked about adrenaline spikes so when somebody gets riled up when somebody gets emotional that process and that thalamus goes to the amygdala the amygdala talks to the uh, hypothalamus the hypothalamus talks to the pituitary gland the pituitary gland talks to the, starts to talk to the adrenal glands and then the adrenal glands give you that surge and often what you see is the thighs are affected and that's what i noticed with tyson fury and again i don't know if anybody's watching on bt sport but the camera was really crap it was it was it was enough to be fair but Fury's feet were going up and down. Now, it doesn't mean that he's scared, but it means that he's been affected by adrenaline. He is getting those adrenaline spikes. And what we see here is that there's a verbal battle going on, and then Fury stands up. He stands up and he starts pacing backwards and forwards, which, again, you can't, you can't argue this. Biology doesn't lie. He's had enough. He doesn't stand up again. But at this particular moment here, yeah, there's an adrenaline spike. He feels like he needs to. Could it be that he thinks Deontay Wilder's getting one over him? Could it be that he's getting frustrated? Could it be that he's not entertaining the crowd or the attention's being brought off him? We don't know. But what we do know without argument is there's been an adrenaline spike. That's affected the thighs. That's why he stood up and that's why he starts moving around. Your like it was before. The that we just like there. That. And that is but this time thing. around, you ain't getting up because I brought my six-foot-inch nails and I bought a big hammer from Alabama, babe. You know, you know what else. Good. Ain't going nowhere. You know what else. I'm going to knock you, Spark. You know what else. I can't wait to do all this. You know what else. You're nothing but a big skinny little guy. Sit down. Sit down. You ain't nothing. Sit down. You ain't scary. You're not terrifying. And again, back to Fury, there's been a narrative that's been playing throughout the build-up about Fury having pillows for fists. And you'll see Johnny Wilder says it here, and then you'll see Fury rub his nose. Again, that rub of the nose is a sign of discomfort. We call it the Pinocchio moment. But there's definitely a Johnny Wilder says pillow for fist, he registers, and then he rubs his nose. But not nobody in no second round. You got pillows for fists. That's why I kept running through you. I kept running through you. I kept running through you. And here in one of the breaks, when this funny stuff was going on within YouTube, to see that whatever is running in the background talks about Fury getting back up. And you'll see Fury acknowledge like this is a fact. This is a fact. So he's just reminding Johnny Wilder that you couldn't put me down. 
And he's also reminding himself as well, again, that power affirmation, the visualization, that self-belief, that internal narrative, but also telling the world, telling the world what you're thinking about can be very powerful. It can be a very powerful motivator. It can be a very powerful internal stimulant, if you will. But he's not lying to himself. The truth is, and you must remember this, is Deontay Wilder with two punches did not manage to keep Fury down. All right, so he's went down twice and he's got up twice. This is fact, you cannot argue with that. He didn't knock out Vermeer Stavern in their first fight, but he made good on that in the rematch. The one fighter that he never knocked out was Tyson Fury. The weed Fury, the weed Fury. The Fury is taking some comfort from this and he's using it as part of the verbal battle against Wilder. You also see this particular part here where they talk about the knockout punch and you see Fury also doing another self So He's aware of Wilder's power. He has to be. He's not, you know, and again, it doesn't mean that he's scared. To be aware of something does definitely not mean you're scared, but he's aware of it. And there's a little bit of a self soothe Go on, just see if you can see where he self soothes himself. History of the heavyweight division, beyond Joe Lewis, beyond Rocky Marciano, Sonny Liston, Iron Mike Tyson, Lennox Lewis, anybody, the highest knockout percentage, the highest knockout percentage, the highest knockout percentage, the highest knockout percentage. And again, there's another example here. So be because there's been more than one, you call it a cluster, where Fury jumps on the fact that Deontay Wilder couldn't put him down. So he's again reaffirming, so this is narrative, and I think this has been played out in the camp. And there wouldn't be wrong to play it out in the camp, there wouldn't be, you know, it, it, it wouldn't have been naive to them or, or they're trying to blow smoke up his arse as we see here in the UK. But he's actually using this as a, as, as a powerful belief system would be my assumption that he did not manage to keep him down. Um, but the thing that Wilder must be thinking is, I hit that guy with my best two punches I can ever throw in round 12 and he got up. Well, what have I got to do to keep him down? Year, now here we've got a self-soothe from Deontay Wilder. And the host starts speaking about we're going to bring the scorecards up. And again, because it's above his emotional baseline, see Deontay Wilder gives himself a self-soothe. Going out of here on stage, everybody's expecting this thing never to get to the cards. But let's put up the cards from the first fight, which was the split draw. And then let's discuss as you split draw. And then let's discuss as you split draw. And then let's discuss as you... What story is he playing inside his own head about the scores from the last fight? Does he really believe that he won the fight? Does he really believe that he actually, on a points-based decision, he should have took the victory? There's something going on when you see Deontay Wilder starts to soothe himself. And then the last bit of body language I picked up, you'll see Fury here when he moves his leg back, he's coming into a defensive position. But then when Deontay Wilder's trainer says, look, we've got the two best heavyweights in the world up on stage here, Fury feels some joy from that, he feels relaxed from that, and he becomes, so when we talk about ventral fronting, like we open ourselves up, you'll see Fury at that particular moment, he puts his leg out just to say, right, I'm opening up now, I feel comfortable with what you're talking about. Take a look at this. But when it's, when it's the time, when it's, when it's that week, it's supposed to get like this. This is what happens when you have the two best heavyweights in the world, both undefeated, both two best heavyweights in the world, both undefeated, both two best heavyweights in the world, both undefeated, both... So out of the two of them, I think it would be fair to say that overall, Deontay Wilder dominated that verbal space. Definitely that verbal space. From the body language, and again, you know, I'm back in Tyson Fury here. I want him to win, back the UK guys through and through. But then you've got Tyson Fury, who again is... He's even higher than he normally is. You can see that the, the verbal effort from Deontay Wilder has got to him. Again, this is not my perspective, but biology doesn't lie. That's why he stood up. That's why he was pacing backwards and forwards. At that particular moment, he lost control. But then you've got Deontay Wilder's self belief in this right hand, and he, he couldn't use the right hand sparring for the build-up in the last fight, but now he can. So that's available. He thinks he can win the fight by being more calculated, being more logic. You've then got Fury saying, I've changed everything. I'm not going to leave it to the judges. I'm going to come in and I'm going to spark you out and I think that's an interesting point there as well because when you look at Fury yes he hasn't knocked many people out of late you know so I, but I, I think he's got something like 20 knockouts at a 29 fight it was something like it's quite a high number compared to what you think he's got but then when you look at Fury's style so yes John Wilder has got the right hand yes he could calm down he could be more calculated but then you look at Fury and actually he's a big fella he's a unit is my point here 
But Fury doesn't box to knock people out. Most of the stuff he comes by is like, when you see Fury moving and responding and getting out the way and slipping punches, it's because he's got a good base, he's balanced. So when you're throwing punches and flicking punches out, it's a bit like saying, well, Alan Shearer didn't save many goals. Yeah, but Alan Shearer wasn't in goals. That wasn't the game plan. I think a lot of people are missing the fact that Tyson Fury's game plan isn't necessarily to knock people out. If he had went in against Wilder and tried to knock him out, he actually might have got knocked out himself. The fact still stands, he hasn't been knocked out yet. If he had went against Klitschko and tried to knock him out, he might have got knocked out himself. But Fury's game plan recently in these high profile fights, I don't think it has been to knock people out. I think it's been to outbox them. And you can see like when Wilder, when Wilder, he puts everything in but he's all over the shop. If he misses, he goes through the ropes. So don't discount Fury's knockout power is my point here. That's what he's been training for. That's what he's saying. And we've got to listen to the data. Now this, you know, this could all be Feng Shui and a bit of la di a bit of sort of psychology there. But he's coming heavier. He's went to the Kronk gym. He, he, he's, he's acknowledging that actually in America, I can't rely on the judges, I need to go for that knockout. So could Fury try to outbox him for points? Possibly. Could Fury go for the knockout against Wilder? Absolutely. But that's what makes it such an intrigue. That's what you get with heavyweight boxing. The intrigue, the excitement, the energy. Who knows? But I would love Fury to come through this fight with a stronger knockout against Wilder. Because to set that fight up with AJ, Fury against AJ would just be a fight of biblical proportions. So again, the body language, probably what you'd expect between two fighters who are pumped, who are prepared to go for the jugular and deliver that knockout victory. So please remember to subscribe, give us a thumbs up, leave your comments below. Who do you think's going to win? Who do they tell me who you think's going to win? And more importantly, how you think they're going to win. Remember on the fight, you can catch me on the True Geordie live stream. Me, True Geordie, Lawrence and the rest of the guys. But above all this, believe in Bruce. Remember to be kind to yourselves and each other.